Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. No problem. Okay. Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Energy 808, the cutting edge, with uh, me, Jay Fidel, and Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us by, um, I guess, by VoIP from uh, uh, in, in Hilo, which is where, where God lives, in Hilo. Anyway, uh, Marco, thank you for joining us again today. Well, in the words of the immortal Fred Rogers, it's a wonderful day in the neighborhood, neighbor, and you're wearing a very nice shirt, so it's a pleasure to be with you today, Jay. Thank you. We got, we got a ton of things to talk about. <clears throat> the, the show is entitled Renewables Coming Clean <laughs> in 28, 2019. It almost rhymed. Um, lots of developments and prospects in Hawaii. Let's start with, uh, as we always do, I think, uh, no, let's start with PGV. Um, yeah, Puna Geothermal Venture. I mean, an important, an important source of renewables, but really stymied by, um, by the eruption. So what happened? Well, what's happening uh, most recently in the past couple, three weeks, is that uh, the folks at ORMAT believe that things have come down enough to be able to provide uh, on their property, uh, essentially make a road over the lava to get to their facility, which prior to having a road, they had to helicopter in on a, I think, weekly basis just to, you know, take a look at things. So they've been trumpeting that as progress and uh, still no date certain by any means in terms of if and when that power plant is going to come back online. I happen to believe that after being uh, uh, lucky in a sense for 25 years from 1993 to 2018 of uh, many megawatt hours worth of, uh, of geothermal power provided to the Helco grid that uh, putting more money and time resources into uh, revivifying a power plant that's in a lava one zone which is the essentially the highest risk uh, just makes very little sense to me both from a uh, on a fiduciary responsibility and also from the perspective of the existing power purchase agreement that that ORMAT and PGV have had with Helco um, is for the first 25 megawatts of that plant out of about a 38 plus megawatt uh, potential output, the first 25 megawatts are paid uh, at the so-called avoided cost rate, which is pegged to the price of oil. And uh, the avoided cost rate contracts have been banned, uh, outlawed, uh, by the Hawaii legislature going back 12 years, Jay, well, almost 13 years. So uh, it, it's not a good deal for the residents of this island, I think, to go geothermal anymore in the East Rift Zone, at least for the foreseeable future, nor is it a good deal in the pocketbook to support avoided cost contract-based power plants, of which we have PGV, uh, two wind farms here, and also, to my surprise, the hydro plant. So. You know, like the bleeding sheep, uh, bleating, not bleeding, bleeding, bleating sheep in Animal Farm, uh, avoided cost bad and fixed lower cost contracts good. <laughs> well, let me <clears throat> throw some thoughts at you. I mean, uh, you know, we renewables are going down in the state. Every time you hear one of the new renewable projects is less than before. And so um, in a landscape of um, re reducing renewable costs or prices, um, an old uh, avoided cost contract like that is really out of, out of touch, if you will. So my question to you is, uh, has there been or should there be a renegotiation of that contract in order to, in order to keep up and bring it current and make it, mm, put it in harmony with other uh, renewable costs? There should have been a renegotiation back in 2011 when Helco was negotiating with ORMAT to buy another dozen or so megawatts from that power plant. So uh, I'm not going to you know, diss Helco for what they weren't able to accomplish back then, but now uh, I think there's an even more compelling case that uh, that for PGV to come back, uh, for any consideration of PGV to come back, it should be at a contract that's more advantageous to Helco or advantageous to, to ratepayers. But what's going on behind the scenes, if anything, I don't know. But, uh, you know, avoided cost is just uh, not in the best interest of, of ratepayers, and uh, any utility in the state should do all that they can 
to within the bounds of the law and contract law to get out of those contracts to the best of their ability. Well, they may have something in the contract. I mean, who knows? But <clears throat> they may have a, a provision in the contract that allows them to renegotiate in, in a practical way because of the, uh, the, the disruption in services. Um, so that, that's something that should be examined. But anyway, um, a couple of other factors going on here. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess one of them is uh, you got to fix the place. And um, uh, they've only been going in by helicopter to see what's going on. Uh, they haven't fixed the place. To get it up and running is not going to be that easy. Um, how long do you think it will take before they could, uh, you know, ideally get it running again? I think that's a huge question, Mark. Uh, during the last, I believe it is, uh, uh, financial reporting for Q3, uh, or maybe it was the first half of this year, the folks at ORMAT said 18 months out, but I think that's a pretty wild ass, uh, uh, excuse me, a wild guess on their part. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're a long time away from even the possibility of that power plant going back online. I mean, to my, uh, in my recollection, all the wellheads were, were capped uh, with uh, some type of uh, material to try to prevent some type of uh, over, you know, blow out wells due to, um, to lava flow encroachment as it's going right over the wellheads. So uh, I don't know if there's a whole lot of experience in, in unplugging wellheads that have been filled with a slurry of mud, concrete, whatever other hardener to try, yeah. to, try to, you know, encapsulate them so they don't blow out. Yeah, that could be very hard, yeah, and dangerous. <clears throat> One other factor I wanted to ask you about, and that is the, the political environment. <clears throat> you know, everybody knows that back in the 90s, it was not a happy time for ORMAT or anybody doing geothermal in the Big Island. And um, a lot of uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, for cultural reasons, uh, didn't like it at all and opposed it. And there was a lawsuit, shut it down for a while and so forth. And, and um, that seemed to uh, raise its head again. Um, when the eruption came around, I mean, it was a kind of a botchy thing. Um, this is a violation of our culture, and so, um, you know, good that it, that it closed down. And I had the, just an impression now, just, a, just an impression, personal impression, that um, the unwillingness of the mayor in the, in the county to allow access um, back to Pune uh, was really also an expression of we're not, we're not in a big hurry to have geothermal come back online. Uh, what do you get about that? What is the political environment for uh, ORMAT and PGV right now? Well, it's, it's mixed. I mean, there are some uh, political leaders, uh, Russell Ruderman, who, uh, Senator Ruderman, who's a great guy and a great senator, a good friend of mine. I mean, he's been on the record for decades of being against geothermal, and he represents uh, Puna. So uh, I certainly respect that position. I think you've got others. Uh, you know, we have Kai Kahele, uh, Senator Kahele, uh, Lorena Noe, and uh, Drew Kanuha, I believe, who took over for uh, Josh Green, who's now Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I haven't polled them all. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, either the county or the state has, uh, has much of a role uh, in terms of uh, uh, approving or dis disapproving the going back online of PGV, I really haven't taken a deep dive, uh, that deep a dive into it to, to know what the possibilities are. And to one of my political friends observed to me something kind of interesting, which is, you know, in terms of possible protests, again, PGV coming back online, if that day should come or is projected to come, is that uh, there have been a lot of people, no shortage of people in that area who have been chased away by the lava flow. So in a kind of perverse sense, maybe there would be fewer people to protest because they split. Right? Because they had their homes destroyed. That's an interesting said, point, Marco. Yeah. This I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see what happens. It's definitely something we have to follow. But let me uh, move on to uh, who, who, know, who Noah. Uh, what's going on with them? They're, they, we've talked about them before, and we ought to get a handle on where they're doing here at the end of the year. Well, it's, uh, I think it's a fascinating uh, drama that's, uh, that's ongoing right now, Jay, with Honua, also known as Honua Ola. Uh, it's a biomass plant up in Pepe Kea, a little bit outside of Hilo. Uh, it used to, for decades, burn the gas, which was the refuse, of course, from the cane harvest that we had here for decades and decades. And then after cane died roughly 1995-ish, uh, they switched to coal, of all things. 
and uh, bring coal in from, from far, far away. Uh, that plant shut down, I believe it was 2005-ish. Mm-hmm. And uh, this mainland group came on board and said, well, gee, let's burn biomass, let's burn trees from the Big Island and trees from elsewhere if necessary. So there is a, uh, a lawsuit which was he- heard by the Hawaii Supreme Court back in the end of October, a uh, suit brought by Henry Curtis and Life of the Land, uh, essentially uh, taking the state and the Public Utilities Commission to task for their May 2017 uh, approval of a power purchase agreement between Huonua and Helco, and Henry's position was that the commission erred by not taking into account the greenhouse gas emissions, as in whatever, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, emissions of course, take place whenever you burn stuff, whenever you combust stuff, whether it's coal, whether it's uh, oil, whether it's biomass. So the, uh, the, the hearing was... Uh, uh, the suit was heard in uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court end of October. Now we're end of December. I would expect a decision probably in the next three or four months. And uh, based on the questions posed by one or more of the justices, the five justices, there was a fair amount of skepticism uh, on the part of the, of the justices as far as the commission's decision, why they didn't take this into account. Uh, but, of course, you and I both know that the questions the justices asked don't necessarily uh, give a strong indication in terms of how they would vote. But if and when uh, the court were to rule for Henry Curtis and Life of the Land, uh, as far as I understand the law, that would remand that original approval back to the commission for reconsideration, which I happen to believe would be most likely the end of that power plant, because I, I, I think that this uh, commission of Jenny Potter, Jay Griffin, and fill in the blank, who the governor is yet to... Uh, Yet to name to replace Randy Awase, I think it's entirely possible that that commission could come to a uh, rather different conclusion compared to the commission that was constituted back in the middle of 2017. So one of the interesting takeaways in this, Jay, is that if PGV doesn't come back online and Huhonua doesn't ever go online, that uh, is about 60 megawatts so of generation on this island. That's a and lot. That's a lot on the big we, island, yeah. It is, and you always need a certain safety margin between total capacity of the grid in terms sure. of being able to produce power versus what the peak consumption is. You don't want to have 185 megawatts of consumption and 192 megawatts of generation capacity because if you lose one, you know, you're talking blackouts. Yeah, so that's this a... cuts, this tech cuts into the margin of Helco's reserve, essentially, which, yeah. by the way, the utilities here, HECO, Helco, MECO, and KIUC, have to report to the commission at the beginning of each year, essentially giving their report in terms of this is what we have as far as peak demand over the past 12 months, and this is what we have in terms of total generation capacity. So that makes it all the more important that the uh, new 60 megawatts, 60 megawatts of solar that were approved by HECO in terms of HELCO in terms of a competitive bidding process, 60 megawatts of solar, 240 hours of megawatt hours of storage, which is pretty damn big, that that, uh, those projects go online sooner rather than later. So it's a very dynamic environment now where you've got, you know, is Huhonua going to actually go online? A big question mark. Is PGV going to come back online? A big question mark. When is solar going to come uh, when is the utility scale solar and storage going to go online? When is going to be the next request for proposals round that Hawaiian Electric will be doing for the next 20, 50, 60, 80 megawatts of solar plus storage? So we live in very exciting and interesting energy times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, all, you know, we, we always talk about having a, a diversification in the portfolio, but matter of fact, you know, it's all connected because you, have, you still have to come up with enough energy to uh, satisfy the market. And, uh, you know, interesting that you mentioned that the issue in front of the Supreme Court, um, well, if it remains the way you think, uh, the issue uh, to the lower court will be um, what, what happens when you consider uh, the effect of the emissions from this, uh, this plant. Well, um, you know, one possibility for the commission, okay, we considered the emissions, but we also considered the need um, to satisfy the market. And uh, if, we, if we believe, and there may be more information on this going forward, if we believe that, for example, uh, Puna Geothermal Venture isn't going isn't to resume, then that would sort of, you know, move the needle toward approving the whole new plant, uh, even though there are, you know, considerations around the emissions. So my only point is that all these things relate to all these other things, 
at the end of the day, you got to keep the lights on. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, another, you know, just one more point about who Honua is, that that contract that would have, was approved in May of 2017 was, I believe, for $0.22 cents a kilowatt hour all in, which is really high compared to what solar plus storage is coming in at. And interestingly, one of the HELCO engineers in, in testimony to the PUC as part of the 6,000-page document dump that HELCO did recently as they're requesting the second base rate increase in two years of the commission. The HELCO engineer, for the first time that I've ever seen, Jay, actually described solar plus storage is going in Hawaii as, quote, dispatchable power, dispatchable power. And that, to me, is a big deal because one of the slams with solar has been, well, it's, it's non-firm, it's not dispatchable. And, and dispatchable means, by the way, in, in grid parlance, that uh, a dispatchable source of electricity is one that, that can be used on demand and dispatched at the request of the grid operators. So it's something that can be turned on or off or adjusted. And prior to solar plus storage, solar was, you know, the sun shined when the sun shined. And it was much less controllable, less dispatchable. So we are getting to the point, because again, according to the utility company, we're getting to the point where solar plus storage is approaching dispatchability. That makes it more firm power. That makes it more valuable to the utility company and more desirable. So we are going in that direction, and we've got solar plus storage that's coming in in the state at somewhere in the $0.10, cents, $0.11, cents, and I believe sub-$0.10 cents a kilowatt hour with these new contracts. What sense does it make to be burning, fill in the blank, burning stuff, uh, putting stuff in the atmosphere at more than twice that rate? That makes no sense. Well, yeah, and I, I totally agree. In fact, you know, we talked about this a long time ago. You, you can't just build solar without storage. You'll never get to 100% renewables. You have to have storage. And I, and I think everybody's recognizing that. Um, and the question is going to be whether the legislature recognizes that. Um, you know, going forward to make sure that we incentivize the storage. So uh, we're going to take a short break, Marco, and we'll talk about the, um, the tax credits right after this break and, and PV in general. We'll be right back. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Come around every Tuesday at 2 p.m. with John, David, Ann, and me. We're talking about history, history lens. Right, John? Exactly. Seeing current events through the lens of the past. Absolutely. See you next time. Okay, Jay, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, you know, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf and me, we're talking about uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. And at this point, we're talking about photovoltaic, PV, rooftop, whatnot. And, uh, you know, the realization, if you will, the community, industry, uh, and, and governmental realization that you can't get to 100% uh, renewables without not only PV, but also storage to make the PV into firm dispatchable power. So, so that means to me, and I'm, I'm an incentive man, I believe in incentives. That means you have to incentivize storage every time you get a chance um, to, to, get, to get it at, at parity. So, you know, for every kilowatt that's generated uh, by PV, You've got to have battery to hold it for the appropriate period of time. Query, what is the status of those incentives right now, Marco? As I understand it, the IRS allows for the 30% investment tax credit, which has been around since George W. Bush days of 2005, which begins uh, a ramp down, by the way, in 2020. So we have 30% this year and 30% next year in 2019, and then it starts to ramp down in 2020 and, and, and thereafter. So as I understand it, the IRS allows for the 30% ITC to include storage, whether the storage is part of, an ex of, a, of a new facility going in, solar plus storage, wind plus storage, something plus storage, and also includes uh, or, or is applicable to if you as a photovoltaic system owner 
like I, I've had a system on my house for a number of years, and I added storage last year, and I claimed the 30% of the cost of that addition uh, or the storage addition to my PV system. I claimed is the ITC. Uh, so as long as the storage is 100% charged by renewable energy, according to the IRS, you can claim the investment tax credit. Now, the state of Hawaii, you can get tax credits for storage at present as long as the storage is part of the overall photovoltaic system, let's say, that's going in from scratch. What has uh, been tried and failed in the past three legislative sessions, much to my great, great unhappiness and dismay, are bills uh, in 2017, 2016, 2015, which failed in conference committee to establish a separate state tax credit for the addition of storage to existing renewable energy systems. So I'm hoping that with new leadership uh, in the energy committees with uh, Glenn Wakai, Senator Glenn Wakai on the Senate side, uh, is the chair um, replacing Lorena Noy and uh, Nicole Lowen on the House Energy and Environment Committee, who's replacing Chris Lee, who's moving over, over to the Judiciary Committee. I'm hopeful that with some new blood, new dynamic, that uh, Nicole and Glenn and the Money Committee chairs will be able to uh, hopefully bring this across the finish line at the end of the session and get it to the governor's desk so there will be state incentive to add storage to existing systems, which uh, I believe would go a long ways in starting the uh, the increasing the security and resiliency of our island grids, especially in light of the fact that this past hurricane season, I think we had no less than six hurricanes and or tropical storms, one of them a Category 4 that was poised to clobber Oahu straight off until it kind of died down. So, I mean, you know, in my opinion, Jay, we're living on borrowed time that we haven't been clobbered like we did like Anihi got to uh, uh, hit Kauai, you know, decades ago. We've been living on borrowed time. Sooner or later, our time is going to be up in terms of our luck. And I would hate to see something Puerto Rico-ish happen to one of our islands. And I know for a fact that distributed storage on an exponentially larger scale than we're seeing now would be nothing but a good thing. I believe that is worth state general fund dollars to support. I, I totally agree. We're on borrowed time. We have to be resilient. We have to be able to come up, not like Puerto Rico, actually come up back back to normal as soon as possible. And storage is a solution to that, as well as the basic principle of reaching 100 percent renewables on schedule. Um, but let me ask you this. I mean, with this tax credit bill that's, that's gone in and failed three times, was that was that about, um, you know, single family residences? Was, was that about, uh, you know, private residences? Or was that also, you know, about the utility? Because it seems to me that it's nice that the guy down the block has a resilient house. I don't have a resilient house. I, I don't have PV. I don't have storage. Um, El Nino is coming. El Nino starts this year, and the chances of Hawaii being hit are very great. Already there are strange weather disturbances in Australia because of El Nino. So, yes, we stand a good chance of getting hit. So the question is, um, what do we do to make the utility resilient? How do we—is um, is there a state tax credit for the utility to build uh, solar farms with, uh, with, you know, matching storage, such as what Kauai did, uh, KIUC did in, in Kauai, got two facilities out there with, um, you know, big storage facilities. Um, and, and Hawaiian Electric would like to do it, too. But we got to go all the way. We have to incentivize this to make it complete uh, if we want to serve not only the individual residences, but the community in general. Comment? Well, and so, uh, aside from what I'll call dabbling, Hawaiian Electric is dabbling. I believe it's in Schofield that they have a 20 megawatt PV array, which they decided that they would fund, that they would build, that they would own. All the other utility scale PV on Oahu and on this island, which in the future, in the months to come, and on Maui, will not be owned and operated by Hawaiian Electric. It'll be owned and operated by third parties, uh, companies like AES out of Virginia, Interjex out of Canada, and other major players, they're the ones who do the design build. They pay for it. They get the tax credit. So, you know, in the 18 years that I've been involved with Hawaiian Electric, they have kind of done the dance back and forth, round and round at times in terms of, do we want to be in the ownership business of, of generation in terms of solar? And 
they kind of get to the brink and they pull back and they get to the brink and they pull back. Well, they finally went over the brink in terms of buying, you know, a, a modest 20 megawatts again, if I remember correctly. But I do not believe that it is Hawaiian Electric's intent or goal to get into the ownership business of utility scale of solar and battery storage. They believe that it's in their better interest and the ratepayers' interest to have somebody else pay for it and enter into a long-term power purchase agreement that is advantageous to the utility, therefore advantageous to ratepayers. Okay, well, that's a choice. I mean, but I think what you said, and which does answer my, my question, is that they go to these third parties and they say in the contract, we want you to not only do solar, we want you to do storage. So go out and do it. And, and if, if those guys get a federal credit or uh, I guess uh, they would be entitled to a tax, uh, state tax credit if they did it all in a bundle, as you said, uh, then, then, every, then everybody, it works that way. Um, so Hawaiian Electric doesn't have to do it as long as it, it, it's able to get it done <clears throat> and whoever is doing it gets the tax credit for an incentive. And, you know, that all seems to work for me. Doesn't it work for you? Does it work for me? Yeah. Does it work for, yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, as long as you can get power purchase agreements, uh, renewable generation plus storage at an advantageous rate, which is what we've seen these past years on Kauai, both with AES and with Tesla, and what we are likely to see with these, uh, gosh, 60 megawatts on this island. I forget how many on Maui. I think it's maybe 30, uh, more than 200, I believe, on, on, on Oahu. So. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, a um, no shortage of suitors of people, companies from different parts of the, the, the globe that want action in our market here in terms of utility scale renewable plus, plus storage. So uh, I see that as the better route to take and let, let the risk be on the developer side rather than on the utility side and on the ratepayer side. Yeah, but you know, um, and this happened in Puerto Rico if, after uh, Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, a good part of the solar solar arrays were broken. Um, by the way, some of them were not broken. It's very interesting how the, the way you fasten the, the cells to the supports made a huge big difference in uh, which ones, you know, were, were continued to generate uh, electricity afterward. But anyway, uh, so if you have these big companies from the mainland uh, come in and do, you know, these um, these arrays, and solar and all that, just as we wish. Um, then, you know, you, and when you need to get them fixed, um, uh, you're not sure whether that company is going to be able to get here or has a presence here uh, that would be able to fix them. And, you know, it, it goes to something that you and I have talked about before, is that for these big, for these big arrays, for these utility scale solar farms, wouldn't it be a better thing for us to use local companies you know, and to encourage the entrepreneurs to build companies that are big enough to handle big solar farms right here. Wouldn't that be better for resilience? Because after all, that's what we're talking about. It would. I'm all in favor of uh, state-based, local-based contractors getting a piece of the action. And I think inevitably these companies coming from far away will be working and partnering with local personnel, local firms, which, uh, I, I, again, I think that's inevitable. But, you know, in terms of uh, when systems go offline and maybe someone has to come in from a, from a great distance, I can tell you, um, you know, these power purchase agreements are, are performance-based. So if the system doesn't perform, and if it's not outputting power because of, of equipment failure, then you lose money. So there's a very high incentive on the part of the system owners to be on top of it and most likely have local-based service and, and, uh, and repair people to be able to take care of issues if and when they come up. Yeah. Well, we can only hope that that's the way it's going to shape up with these projects, that there, that there will be, um, you know, local presence and they'll have spare parts and they'll have labor, uh, you know, that's skilled enough to fix it when it's torn up, which could happen. I mean, you know, wh which way would you want to go to create the kind of resilience that we will need, um, not we may need, but we will need uh, when a storm strikes, uh, a climate change storm? How would you like to see, you know, all of these facilities structured uh, to best provide that resilience? A heck of a lot more battery storage that is uh, strategically located 
throughout the grid, both uh, what's called behind the meter, which means it's sighted uh, after the electric utility meter. We were talking Tesla, LG Chem, Tabuchi, Sony, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 kilowatt hours. And then also on the utility side where you've got megawatt hours of storage at substations, megawatt hours of storage at uh, power, uh, power plants so that you are having it creating the infrastructure that if part of the grid gets clobbered, that it's not going to take out the whole system. So you can essentially uh, microgrid certain parts of the grid that are able to uh, tap into battery storage. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this, Jay, and that there aren't that many experts on it because it's a new and growing field in terms of moving from the Edisonian hub and spoke of more than 100 years ago where you had central power plants and then radio, radially uh, exporting power thousands of miles away. Now distributed generation or, or uh, distributed energy resources is, uh, you know, is truly a two-way power flow. And, you know, before we go, and I know we're running out of time, one of the things that I think is really super critical, which is happening, although not quite as fast as I want, is that utility companies traditionally up until now have seen rooftop solar with a degree of wariness. It's essentially been foisted upon them through legislative fiat and by regulatory fiat. And these systems, the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that are around the country and more than 80,000 across our little state uh, that are beyond the control of the utility company. And that's something that hasn't been a problem unless and until you get to so many out there that it becomes more of an issue. But I think to some extent they've, they've tolerated, they've been forced to tolerate rooftop solar. Uh, but now that rooftop solar and storage is becoming more dispatchable and becoming uh, becoming, it's become more valuable to them. It's become more valuable to them because we are moving in a place of where these systems, again, rooftop solar plus storage can provide bulk services and or grid services. And what I mean by that is that the battery storage and the solar can actually work in the view of the, the grid operators uh, as, a, as a supportive and beneficial to the grid overall, rather than being seen as something to tolerate, something to manage. We're not there yet, but we are moving in the direction where behind the meter solar, behind the meter storage can provide very valuable grid services to the grid writ large, therefore benefit the utility company and benefit all ratepayers. And that's my speech and I stick to it. Oh, no, that's really wonderful. It's a, sort of the mesh technology uh, everybody helps everybody, everything is connected, and that's where we have to go. And we have to build that so it can be resilient, even in the face of extreme weather. Well, thank you, Marco. This has been a great discussion. I hope we can uh, continue this two weeks hence, and um, I look forward to talking with you then. In the meantime, Happy New Year, Marco. And a holy Marco Hikiho to you, my friend. Yeah, I thought I heard they say before for Christmas, they said, uh, what is it, Meli Kaliki Marco? Yeah. Meli Kaliki Marco, and now we're past that, and now we're into Holy Marco Hikiho. So, very warm Marco Hikiho to you, my friend. Thank you, Marco. Take care. Aloha. You rock, my friend. Bye bye. <laughs>